I am glad to chair this session dealing with his visions of the Holy Land. As is well known, while many thousands of pilgrims and wayfarers travel to the real Holy Land, the Holy Land and its jewel, Jerusalem, traveled in Christian culture as an image, an ideal, a vision. It traveled on the wings of countless literary and artistic works that sometimes blur the borders between the earthly and the heavenly. And while the Holy Land filled up visions and dreams overseas, these visions also had the power to influence, even to shape, Holy Land history. The renowned Israeli poet Yehuda Michai, a Jerusalemite himself, wrote, the air of Jerusalem is saturated with prayers and dreams, like the air of our industrial cities. It is hard to breathe. And from time to time, a new shipment of history arrives, and the houses and towers are its packing materials. Later, these are discarded and piled up in dumps. Strong words especially now, because in hard times, words acquire new meanings. In these days, men and women, young and old, parents and children, go out to the street shouting equality, civil rights, democracy. This was the vision underlying the establishment of the Israeli state in the Holy Land, the, the vision that made it survive and flourish. Now this vision is opposed by other visions and other concepts. This demands, especially of us historians, to listen well to the lessons history teaches us, modern history and history of earlier peri periods as well, and to take into account the historicity and the context in which words and concepts are used and can be effective. We are going to hear uh, two lectures. Uh, the first is by Dr. Federico Montinaro from the University of Tübingen. Hi. Um, Dr. Montinaro studied ancient Byzantine and Islamic history, awarded a PhD in Byzantine history in two 2013 at the Ecole Pratique des Hauts d'Etudes, Sorbonne. He works in Tübingen since 215, first as a postdoctoral post researcher in the Collaborative Research Center, uh, Threaten Orders. Then as a substitute chair for ancient history, and currently as a leader of his own research group, Religious Conflict and Mobility, 700 to 900, Byzantium and the Greater Mediterranean. Dr. Montinaro will speak about religious conflict, mobility, and the Holy Land, reframing late antique and Byzantine pilgrimage. Please. So, thank you. So, if I'm questioned about the faith by heretics and I do not know how to explain the dogma, what shall I do? Not only for you who do not know, but also for those who think they do know, it is a danger to talk about the faith. So, say to the person questioning you, I'm a simple person, but if you really and truly seek to know the truth, go to the church and there you will learn what is the right-minded religion. The simple is not someone to give up. But is there not some method or other by which the simple may confute the heretic? Well, on this subject, listen to a short discussion that took place not very long ago in Alexandria. Representatives had gathered from the followers of Severus and Gaianus and Barsanufius against somebody who was uneducated as far as the Logos was concerned, but wise in the Lord, a preacher of the faith of the Catholic Church, and they were fighting against him. He then put the following question. 
If the emperor owned certain treasuries and owner dwellings where his essential mysteria are dispatched, to whom will he confide these places? To those who are faithful to him or to those who are unfaithful? The others said to him, it is quite obvious that the emperor will confide such dwellings to those who are the most uh, faithful of all his subjects. Then in reply, the orthodox person said to them, consequently learn that there is no faith on earth which is orthodox except for that of the Catholic Church. And for that reason, God has confided to us all the holy and most essential of his dwellings, in which when he dwelt here, he worked his mysteria. That is Nazareth, Tabor, Bethlehem, Jordan, Sion, Golgotha, and the Anastasis. And not only this, but there is also Sinai. And to sum up, for all the holy places of the New and Old Testament, it is we of the Catholic Church who are in possession. These are extracts from the questions and answers by Anastasius, the monk of Sinai, and one we might, in hindsight, call the first uh, Melchai theologian. I use this term in, um, in its uh, medieval sense of uh, Chalcedonian Christians who accept uh, uh, six or seven ecumenical councils. Whether the questions and answers, not Anastasius' major work, represent an actual or fictional dialogue between the educated and the simple, there is no denying that the text is inspired by the pastoral concerns so evident in his other works. Writing more than a generation after the Muslim conquest of the Near East, Anastasius still regarded Christian heretics as a spiritual danger far greater for his interlocutor than the Muslims. Although, interestingly, interestingly the argument here appears to be recycled from his own polemical tract against the Jews. That there was a theological debate of sorts around the subject of Christian pilgrimage is not a discovery in any sense. Against a finite, finite corpus of well-known itineraries and travel logs, Latin and Greek, starting in the fourth century, scholarly attention has focused on the one hand on the pro and contra arguments of church fathers as to the legitimacy of the practice itself, unveiling often political, even personal motives behind the construction and promotion of the Holy Land together with or opposed uh, to Jerusalem uh, uh, itself. The study of new and emerging forms of holiness and of the literary genres and mobility associated with their cult has helped to enhance uh, the broader picture. This has all contributed much in the direction of rescuing late antique, late antique Christian pilgrimage from an anthropological oversimplifications of what we should definitely no more simply regard as popular religion. Comparatively, less attention has been paid to the phenomenon of confessional appropriation so explicitly illustrated by Anastasius' argument ab absurdo aimed visibly at the Miaphysites. I will return to better contextualizing Anastasius' statements. For now, I would like to address the more general issue of the interactions between pilgrimage and late antique religious conflict, limiting the inquiry to intra-religious controversy, thus leaving mostly aside broader phenomena of appropriation from paganism, Judaism, and in uh, Islam. In a 1998 article, Lorenzo Perrone asked the question of whether theology and dogma had any relation with the holy places and pilgrimage. Focusing on the evidence for both exclusion of Miaphysites from accessing the holy places and the Miaphysites' own rejection of the intrinsic value of the practice in the century that followed the Council of Chalcedon, Perrone concluded that they did. This evidence will be rehearsed, I understand, by Hartmut uh, Lepin. Perone's approach has been sometimes dismissed in later scholarship as uh, basically naive. Thus, in her monograph on encountering the sacred in late antiquity, uh, Bruria Beton Ashkeloni replied, exploiting holy places as a weapon of ecclesiastical power during controversies and debating the very idea of sacred space and the encounter with the holy are two different matters. And in her broader conclusions on the early church father's attitude toward pilgrimage, one reads, it is difficult to disregard how few the theological discussions are, even though the language of the claims is in many cases purely theological. It would seem then that the emergence of Christian topography scarcely, scarcely influenced Christian theology as such. By concentrating today on a necessarily small selection of Byzantine and Melkite texts from the 7th to 9th centuries, I hope to show that both approaches can prove insufficient and to suggest that we twist around the way we look at the issue altogether. Before doing so, a few words are in order regarding the simple whom Anastasius of Sinai addresses and who is the ubiquitous target of the Christian theologian, alternatively extolled or vilified for the elusive qualities that make him or her 
equally prone to education and misdirection, invariably put in their place, when the theologian does not decry inadequacy himself, uh, berate himself as, as uh, simple. So grasping the simple in these opposing mirrors is, well, not simple. Jack Tanus has rightly spoken of the layering of knowledge in the early medieval Middle East, especially at play when it comes to the reception of theological controversies in different strata of society and the resulting setting of confessional boundaries. So much for the audience. There is also, however, so to speak, a conscious layering of instruction on the part of the author, evident in Anastasia's text. So the uneasy question arises, what is actually theology there? At the other end of the development of Melkai thought on the subject of pilgrimage and the holy places, one finds the Kitab al-Burhan, or Book of Demonstration, once erroneously attributed uh, to uh, Eutychius of Alexandria, but dated in all probability from the late 9th century and attributed by Samir Khalil Samir on the basis of uh, two slightly contradictory colophones, here is one of them, to an otherwise unknown Peter Bishop of Betras, Capitolius, not uh, the, no, Peter the, the martyr. The sites of Palestine and beyond take central stage in about one-fifth of the two printed volumes of texts in this uh, attempt building on centuries of uh, Greek patristic tradition and marked by highly apologetical tones to fortify the common believer in his Christian faith in a word they might feel they do not otherwise quite physically uh, possess anymore. Christ has given us the relics of himself and the places of his sanctification. In this word has a heritage and the pledge of the kingdom of heaven and the delights of the world to come which he promised us. Wherever there is a place that got glorified and allowed uh, by, um, hallowed by the appearance in it of his Christ and the presence of his Holy Spirit, be it plain or mountain, wherever there is a place in which God spoke to any of his prophets before that or in which his wonders were seen, he has set all these places in, his, in the hands of those who believe in Christ to pass as an inheritance from fathers to sons forever until it brings them the kingdom of heaven which does no, not uh, perish. After listing the sites connected to Christ and offering a similar development uh, on those of the apostles, uh, the author uh, moves uh, systematically to the martyrs. And then he eventually concludes, God did not give the sites of the prophets and the relics of Christ and the places of the apostles and martyrs to any people but the Christians. It is they who sought them out and honored them and built churches upon them. That was done by the Christian kings, by governors and others, out of their eagerness on account of the great faith and their desire for good, uh, through the working of God in them in respect of that and is strengthening them for it. So one may be wondering whether this, which I will stop short of calling the most comprehensive theology of the Christian holy places, was simply bound to materialize among the Melkites at a time when, as uh, Milka has shown, the Patriarchate of Jerusalem was reorganizing itself around that very important asset. Reality is, I think, a bit more nuanced. Let us go back to Anastasius. And if you say that we hold the places because of imperial force and tyranny, you can be convicted of lying. Behold, how the barbarians now control the land of the holy places and God has not taken them away from us. But if, as it is quite likely, you will want to say that once upon a time the Aryans gained control of the holy places for a short while, consider that it is quite true that they snatched the holy places away by imperial force and tyranny, but they were not strong enough. At once God restored them once more to us, the Orthodox, and behold now for 700 years. On hearing these things, the heretics retired, put to shame. Interestingly, in the later reworkings, reworkings of this text, the Aryans and the Muslims, put side by side in the original redaction, are merging one into one and the same enemy of the Trinity. As far as the historicity of a temporary Aryan takeover is concerned, this is not a word attested for fourth century Palestine in quite the dramatic fashion implied by Anastasius, but rather evokes the testimony of the hero of Nicene resistance during imperial Aryanism, Athanasius of Alexandria, for Egypt. In a letter to his supporters, uh, preserved only in the form of excerpts in Latin translation, and that Athanasius had deployed an argument which Anastasius would almost seem to have intentionally reversed. 
May God indeed console you, for I know that not only this grieves you, but also the fact that others have obtained the churches through violence while you have been thrown out of the places. So they possess the places, but you, the apostolic faith, although they are in the places, they are thrown out of the true faith. Although you are truly thrown out of the places, the faith is truly in you. Let us consider which is greater, the place or the faith, clearly the true faith. Who then has lost more? Adanasius then even ventures in a, into a problematic uh, courses on the uh, Jerusalem temple. So the Egyptian milieu is in fact the very target of Anastasius of Sinai's polemic. The debate he purports to report took place, as we have seen, not very long ago in Alexandria. In Anastasius' times, the Miaphysites were following the Muslim conquest for intensive purposes in charge of Christian affairs in Egypt. But the places that really matter, as Anastasius pointed out, stayed in Chalcedonian hands. They were ready. One might see evidence of a purely Melkite program behind the promotion of the Holy Land. In order to truly prove my point that this does not have to be exclusively the case, I will now finally move to a different, the last great religious controversy of the late, late antiquity, the one around the veneration of icons. Condemned as idolatry in Constantinople in 754, re-established at the Seventh Ecumenical Council, or Nicaea II in 787, outlawed again in 815, and reintroduced for good with the triumph of orthodoxy in 843, icon veneration found its first and most influential theologian once again in a Melkite, John of Damascus. Right in, in the Holy Land in the 740s, uh, the last of his treatises on the subject and against imperial iconoclasm, John, for the first time, equated the veneration reserved to relics and the holy places to that paid to, the image, to images. So the second kind of veneration is that whereby we venerate creatures through whom and in whom God worked our salvation, either before the coming of the Lord or in his incarnate dispensation, such as the Mount Sinai and Nazareth, the crib in Bethlehem and the cave, the holy place of Golgotha, the wood of the cross, the nails, the sponge, the reed, the holy and semi lens, the upper, the tunic, the linen cloth, the wine sheet, the holy tomb, the, tomb, the fountain head of uh, resurrection, the gravestone, sign of the holy mount, and again the Mount of Olives, the ship gate, and the blessed present of Gethsemane. In another strictly contemporary treatise as part of his opus magnum, the, fa the Fountain of Knowledge, John defended pilgrimage to the holy places in similar terms, although from a different uh, perspective. Now, it is not surprising that the issues of icons and pilgrimage should become associated, for both represented material aspects of cult susceptible of being condemned as idolatry. Importantly for my purposes, John's Theology of icon veneration apparently singled out for anathema during the first wave of iconoclasm and rehabilitated at Nicaea II proved extremely influential, marking somewhat by accident the entry of the holy places as well into Byzantine theology that we might call proper. One of the early Constantinopolitan echoes of this new and inextricable connection is found in a letter of uh, Theodore the Studite to the Patriarch of Jerusalem, one of several. Uh, to the Mechites, dating from the 820s, that is during a relaxation of crackdowns of, um, on iconodules in the uh, empire. And thus the collection of uh, the alms have not yet taken place as we desired, apart from what is set out in the attached note. With the benefactors acknowledging reception of greater favor than they give, for they are made worth of some form of communion in the holy places, where the great mystery of piety was perfected, God seen in our form. How oh, the unspeakable wonder, which we, or rather the whole earth under the sky, profess and venerate from the very starting point of the Annunciation as an inheritance from our fathers, divinely announced in painted form. Here I'm not really sure about the translation. I went for the easiest, but I'm happy to, um, uh, to enlist uh, um, some help, and Christ could not be professed otherwise, as you, O most blessed, teach us, but the ill-named icono Iconomax deny, as if animated by an evil uh, spirit. In fact, the section on the holy places in the Book of Demonstration ends, too, in the description of not just an icon, but the first icon of all, and the, a relic uh, for the matter. The most wonderful of his relics, which Christ has bequeathed to us, is a napkin in the church of Arua, 
uh, Odessa, in the region of Jazeera. Uh, with this, Christ wiped his face and there was fixed on it a clear image, uh, not made by painting or drawing or engraving, and not changing. Incidentally, this passage provided a secure terminus anti-cramp for data and uh, the work, necessarily composed before the image of Edessa was transferred to Constantinople in 1944. Um, so the theology of icons so promptly adopted in Constantinople, in fact, struggled to gain acceptance in Rome, where the issue was not regarded as one concerning the fate, but simply one of custom, until the last decades of the ninth century. Famously and ironically, the Mechites themselves long hesitated to include Messiah II in their canonical collections. That ever new aspects of materiality should enter doctrine with the mystery of via the mystery of incarnation is a development that one could optimistically regard as a democratization of theology, much in line with the Eastern theologians' efforts to speak with the simple. This brings us back to the initial question. So what we do have is evidence for debate on pilgrimage and the holy places popping up not just on occasion, but at every outbreak of a doctrinal controversy, and therefrom into the very mainstream of religious literature. Regardless of whether we take this debate at its theological face value, or we regard it as political struggle in disguise, or indeed we accept more plausibly that it was something in between, we will see the theologian attempting to encourage or discourage a practice as a conscious act of appropriation or disownment. It is about time we drop the artificial wall between the theologian and the simple and acknowledge the existence of a continuum of communication, especially visible in the pastoral care that must have been one of the backbones of late antique education. What is lacking, we will notice, is clear evidence of what pilgrimage really was past what was negotiated in that encounter. Evidence that there was a pilgrim so simple to not at all engage with the controversies of the day. So open your Wilkinson and take the earliest Byzantine accounts of the Holy Land, the one by the monk Epiphanius, composed at the height of the iconoclast controversy, or Photius, the Constantinopolitan patriarch who so insistently pleaded the cause of Nicaea II with his Oriental counterparts. Beyond Byzantium, take Agaria herself a text of which we do not know how it was framed, but that is, in the extant form, for a large part, a painstaking description of the Jerusalem liturgy, as established right at the end of the Arian controversy and the settling of accounts between Caesarea and Jerusalem, for the matter, surely under Cyril. In other words, late antique and Byzantine pilgrimage may have not only been deeply entangled with, but to a great extent have represented an expression of religious conflict, the simplest possible theological statement, which the present paper is the simple possible invitation to explore as such. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this most interesting uh, paper. And the floor is open for questions, remarks, thoughts. Bashing. Milka. Thank you for this uh, very interesting and provocative lecture. <laughs> um, and I, I'm, I would really like, to, like you, maybe you could further talk a little bit more about what do you think the role the, of, uh, of Jerusalem, uh, the iconodal role that Jerusalem played here in the iconoclastic controversy and its connection to uh, the holy places as uh, in comparison to other patriarchates, maybe, like the special role, play, role played by Jerusalem in this case, and, and this Econodal's stand that John of Damascus takes. Yeah, well, uh, of course we have uh, people that are uh, connected to the Patriarch of Jerusalem, to uh, Marsabas, uh, in some cases, uh, from John of Damascus to, as uh, among the theologians, uh, uh, Theodora Bukura, uh, and uh, in itself, you know, we have a, I understand, uh, a presence of Sabbate monks uh, in Constantinople. We have contacts that are uh, well attested by the likes of, uh, of uh, Theodore of, uh, of Studios, 
And uh, we have in uh, Constantinople and Byzantium, in Indian Empire, this general perception that the, uh, the East is a safe place. So, you know, the, the, uh, the lives uh, of, the, of the martyrs of iconoclasm uh, uh, invite, go as far as uh, to invite uh, the, um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, persecuted monks to, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, unprecedentedly uh, flee uh, uh, persecution and martyrium and go to the East or to other places. Uh, like uh, southern Italy, um, uh, for example. So, uh, uh, yeah, it is, of course, um, um, they appear to play a big role. It, it is, in fact, this is why I said uh, at some point it's counterintuitive and a bit ironic that, I, that, uh, that the Merkite and the, the Patriarchate of Jerusalem in particular take so long to, uh, uh, instead of, uh, uh, after having produced, in fact, the you know, the theological uh, uh, core of, uh, of, uh, of uh, elaboration on, on icon veneration and to, in fact, which is uh, basically, uh, um, um, you know, o o just uh, overtaken by, uh, 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 no, what's, uh, what's the word, it's not overtaken, it's, a bit, uh, it's accepted uh, as, a, as in, in, in Byzantium, like, they take so long to uh, accept uh, this, the Seventh uh, Council, and that's uh, just a very complex question of how and when and uh, and uh, and why, under what circumstances, this happens. That uh, you know that the Council, uh, in fact, proclaiming uh, icon veneration uh, uh, is then um, so late accepted in uh, in in, uh, in the East. So uh, uh, yeah, this this is what uh, you know what comes to my mind when you. Uh, Ask me to elaborate. I don't know. It's, uh, but you certainly know this. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Professor Goldhill. I, I wonder if you could say a little more about two things: the argument about imperialism, which is extremely interesting, about who actually possesses the territory, uh, and the past, about what they knew about previous arguments on this. Mm. I was very struck. I know it's in Latin. But Augustine in the City of God is having to deal with the fact that the city of Rome has been sacked. And he has a very long exposition, deeply theological exposition, of what it means to have been attacked and lost. And is, is this God's failure or not? And of course, he describes every human being as a peregrinus, as a, as a traveler, a stranger in the world. And so we're all immigrants all the time, is Augustine's view, because we're not in the City of God. And he, he seems to have such a more sophisticated and careful and profound argument about these issues. But I assume your guys just don't know Latin. Don't, this tradition doesn't come through in any way. Do they look back to the, to the Cappadocians who write about this stuff? Or Yeah, well, we're going to go back to a source of uh, four, four and fifth century uh, yeah. church fathers. But uh, Latin, uh, I mean, we have contact with, uh, with the Latin West uh, around the year 800, famously with, uh, you know, Charlemagne's uh, uh, um, mission. And uh, there's, uh, there's some, uh, in fact, there's even some uh, uh, con religious controversy happening with, uh, with, Western, um, with Western monks. But um, uh, no, when the, as far as the past is concerned, my, you know, when we read Anastasius uh, and he's thinking of the Aryan controversy, he has this, um, I mean, he makes this, um, this strong uh, claim that the Aryans basically took over everything. And, um, you know, th there is, of course, especially in this, uh, in this uh, um, uh, exchange between Caesarea and Jerusalem, uh, uh, there is some taking over going on, but uh, not to the extent that Anastasia seems to suggest, at least not, not to my uh, knowledge. In fact, there is, uh, uh, the same, a similar thing is happening in Egypt, and I, I'm really under the impression that Anastasius has read Athanasius and is like twisting uh, 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 Athanasius' uh, arguments, like you know, where the Aryans, um, um, you know, where the, the in fact the disownment of the only places, which are of course not the uh, not not the only places that we conceive them of uh, in in uh, in, uh, in Egypt. It means mostly the churches and church property, and um, and he twists this uh, and use, applies it to uh, uh, as a general argument to the entire East 
although so there is some uh, there is some uh, manipulation some confusion and some uh, you know it's like uh, 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 you know, uh, three, four centuries uh, before, so there's a logic. But, um, yeah, the, yep, yeah, I would stop on that. Yes, Michael. Um, yeah, thank you for enlightening me about Mysteria. Uh, Maurice Halbach, in his book about collective memory, uh, has the appendix about the legendary topography of the Gospels of the Holy Land and differentiates between the Galilee and Judea, sort of the intangibility of the Galilee to the, to the actual events. You spoke so much about then the relics and the remnants, the actual activities, the monuments and the churches. Was there also a relationship to nature? In other words, were there also nature parts, or was this something which was not in the text at all? Mm. Like um, the mountains, the lake. Oh, sure. The, the, I mean, the, the, this. Uh, I mean, the, the main text uh, is uh, here probably the, the the book of demonstration. This is a very long uh, bit of text, uh, which like it goes like really in great in great detail. I, I don't know any other text that does that. Like uh, I mean, of course, we know other texts from uh, from early late antiquity that do that. But uh, uh, in the in the context at that time, where we would think that uh, you know pilgrimage is uh, is no more that that that, that 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 big thing. And there certainly is. Okay, you know, I would uh, I would lie now if I if I uh, you know point to uh, one or the other passage because I, I I don't have all the texts in my in my head, but. Uh, uh, there certainly is something about uh, also about landscape and about uh, uh, natural uh, uh, phenomena. Uh, you know how to call them. But. Okay, may may I ask a, a short question, which bothered me for some time? Uh, given the defense you described of uh, of the holy places by the theologians. How come there are so little pilgrimage accounts coming from Byzantium? That's, a, uh, that's an interesting question and uh, that I, I don't think I can really answer. Um, I mean, it is problematic. Uh, it is also what we, uh, you know, what we call pilgrimage. I mean, in the, uh, a source that I, I, I talk about something that I know. So uh, the the church councils in uh, uh, you know in the in the eighth and the ninth century, in fact, describe uh, you know people that so-called sometimes legates who uh, you know are missions uh, uh, through the caliphate on behalf of the patriarchs, but in fact, uh, some, uh, most often on behalf of. Uh, of local governors, and so these people are uh, traveling as well. So th there is some, uh, um, yeah. I, um, I, d I don't know if this, if this in part. Uh, I mean, Fortius himself, for example, is uh, he has this description of the Holy Land probably from one of the of the people that traveled for one of his councils uh, to Constantinople. But you can count them on one hand. And uh, I mean. Theodore of Studios says in one of his mm -hmm. letters, uh, you know, one day I, I have to come to, yeah. I have to come and see that. But uh, does he do that? There, there's, there's movement, there's people traveling, not all the time. Uh, the eighth century is pretty dark. And towards the end of the ninth century, there's some, uh, in my understanding, some uh, opening, um, which might be linked to, uh, you know, the the waning of Abbasid power, the uh, and uh, emergence of local governors. So, I'm sure they traveled, but they didn't write about it. The genre mm. is mm. Western. That, mm. That's my comment. Yeah, but this is what someone said. I think it was uh, Gibet Dagron or somebody who said that uh, no. th th there was no such a thing in the East as uh, as uh, as a Western pilgrim. So it was a uh, no. um, it, it was. Um, yeah, so it was not as established. That's, uh, that's a way to look at it. But I, I, I don't know. Well, this is a pretty Byzantine text. At least they, they received it in Byzantium. Okay. So. Just uh, Marie, yeah. two points to consider. I don't know if there's a full answer to your question. But two points to consider. The first is indeed a literary one and question of 
kind of literary tradition that emerges from Byzantium in the 7th and 8th century. And, and that's Avril Cameron for you with her famous thesis about the, the tendency in Byzantium to restrict to a theological kind yeah. of uh, literary tradition. And the other point is just um, totally hypothetical, but still something sounds kind of reasonable. During the 8th and 9th centuries, the Muslims are still taking by Byzantines as captives. So uh, I don't know how, how safe the Byzantines would feel going around in uh, crossing uh, parts that were still considered frontier zones uh, for different purposes. So it's something to think about as well. Yeah, but again, I didn't ask about uh, the, the real movement, about mobility, but, but about, uh, the literature. about the literature about the evidence that we have. In any case, thank you very, very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.